we're going to have one global monetary system, it's going to be Bitcoin, then theoretically it would be of order $100 trillion. Both Moore's law that drives technology and Metcalfe's law that drives communications come to play. So he had $13 million for the midpoint. I would regress to $9 million. We see adoption growing for companies, for pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, and eventually as national treasury. If there's an inevitability about Bitcoin, this is just further data support for the fact that indeed it's a power law. When would that power law suggest that Bitcoin gets to a gold market cap? It's superior monetary technology. That's not saying it's going to saturate. The power law goes up forever. With 30 trillion, you'd reach a knee at 2035 and around a million bucks. Before we start into uh, where you see power law, S-curves, Lindy effect, and also really interesting, I found that the last point that you made with Bitcoin is a specialized AI for money that I, I never heard that mm -hmm. in, in that sense. That is really interesting also. Um, just give us f your personal view, like why is Bitcoin so important for you personally? And then let's get right. into the presentation. Okay. Look, uh, my interest in Bitcoin comes, uh, I think, from a few angles. You know, when I was very young, we had silver coins circulating. And I would go to the bank and you could, you know, give them some paper money and you would get silver coins. This was before 1964 in the U.S. And so I was a coin collector then and, and even later. And so I was sort of interested in the history of money and uh, later became interested in markets and so forth. But uh, the more recent interest in Bitcoin came about because I have a background in high performance computing in supercomputing and in technology. And so naturally it was a technology that I would want to look at. And then I had some personal motivation because I have two young children. And so I went from, you know, having one or two mouths to feed to many mouths to feed. And so I had to think about how can I stay ahead for their education and, and have enough money for their educational fund And as part of the technology overview work that I do at, at Orion X, uh, at one point we were looking at, yeah, should we focus more on AI issues? Should we focus more on certain other issues? And I thought I would pick Bitcoin to drill down on, you know, amongst our pool of analysts, because I didn't think the others were going to drill down as far on that. And when I started to look at it, uh, really with the white paper, the white paper is what killed me. Uh, because when I saw the equations eight and nine, I think they are in the white paper, but whatever they are, that uh, show that how difficult it is, it becomes exponentially harder as you add blocks to the blockchain. Then I said, oh, this is something real. And so I, I started using Bitcoin in late 2014. That's when I had my first purchases. So it's almost 10 years. And initially, I used it to transfer money between the U.S. and Thailand. It was a faster, less expensive way to move money for international transfers. Unfortunately, too much of what I brought over, I then sold, you know, for, for living expenses. I should have held more than I did. But I started, you know getting deeper and deeper and going down into the rabbit hole. And I would say I became a maximalist in late 2017 because of the hard forks and the blockchain wars and uh, have been on the maximal side ever since. I, I saw BCH and BSV as, as dividends to be collected and then sold. And that showed me really the, the long-term survivability of Bitcoin was proved in the marketplace by them. Really interesting. So you used actually Bitcoin first as a as a payment network to transfer money. Uh, I think most people come in <laughs> first for the store of value and then kind of see like, oh, you can you know, actually, it's like a payment network. Uh, is it important for you to, to use it as like the medium of exchange to steer up some, some of the, of the <laughs> circular economies? No, not so much now. <laughs> you know, I really am more interested in the store of value world for long-term value. Uh, look, if, if you want to buy coffee, use fiat. <laughs> fiat is depreciating, right? 
So, I mean, I think it's great. We have to develop these uh, second layer solutions. And uh, I want to see the Lightning Network grow out and I want to see the other second layer solutions grow out. And we want to see more merchants adopting usage. And that's going to be great. And it would be nice that, you know, we could more conveniently have other Bitcoin balances, you know, that we can hold on to it and spend. But at this point, uh, it's the store of value where the focus is and where my modeling and, and research focus is. Mm, really cool. Perfect. And uh, I think we we can directly get in your uh, slides that you prepared because they are really nice. And, and uh, I would like to, to learn more about that and maybe afterwards uh, so, some questions and uh, some, some more diving into that. Um, and the slides that I saw is like really interesting with because of the power law and more and more people become interested in this power law. I think Giovanni was kind of the, the first one that I saw right. uh, that, that talked about it. He was on the podcast uh, recently. Also Fred Kruger was on the podcast. He's also um, right. uh, someone of an advocate for, for the power law. Uh, so, so why is the, the power law uh, so intriguing for you? And uh, then you can also start sharing uh, your, your presentation. Okay. Well, I, Uh, you know, I was looking at the models, uh, in that sort of period, you know, from say 2016 through 2019, you know, I looked at the STF model as other people did. And I knew it was problematic. I knew that it was going to, to blow it up at some point because it's a divergent model. And in fact, it really is an exponential model in the limit, uh, that masquerades as a power law because Essentially, it's something that looks like roughly two to the cube, right? And you converge on that. And that is exponential growth. So I was concerned about that. And I was looking around for alternatives. And so the two alternatives I looked at, one was an integral form of, of the stock to flow model. Instead of looking at the differential stock to flow, look at all the future flow that's yet to be mined. Look at it like a gold mine that has reserves. And I tried to build a model called the future supply model. And uh, it was okay. It could fit the data, but it was too conservative. It would have you saturate at a market cap of something like one or two trillion and uh, the way it was projecting at the time. And then I came across H.C. Uh, Berger once, uh, a tweet that he had that had a parallel model, essentially. And that was how I first saw it. And then I started working with it. And that was in late 2019. So that was about five years ago. I was not aware of uh, Giovanni's discovery at that time. Only became aware later, actually because of Fred. I was the one that introduced Fred to the power law idea because I sent him a chart that was actually a log log plot. And when he saw that with a straight line, he said, wow, I've never seen anything like this in all my years of investing. And then Giovanni raised his hand and said, hey, you know, I introduced that to the world 10 years ago, you know. So Giovanni, I already knew Fred, but now Giovanni and I have become friends as well through all of that. So we certainly uh, appreciate that he was the discoverer of the power law. But it, I, so I looked at that. I looked at S-curve, not the logistic type, but something that's a little more uh, nuanced, which is the Weibull cumulative distribution function. And I was the first one to apply that sort of model. And what you find is that in the early years that that reduces to a power law, that becomes exactly power law form. It adds one parameter, which is some sort of ultimate topping out value, which could be in market cap or price. And so I was looking at to see if you know, is the power law running out? Is it going to saturate? And if it is going to saturate, how far out would that be? And right now we haven't uh, reached saturation. You know, we're, we seem to be nowhere near that, which is encouraging. And uh, we'll look at some slides on that. Oh, really cool. And uh, just for um, maybe people that are not aware or new to the space, uh, you mentioned stock to flow also. Uh, can you give us a quick summary of that? Like what, what's the stock to flow and, and where did it originate yeah. from? Sure. Well, stock to flow from plan B is, was, is basically an inflation model. It's tied to how much new Bitcoin supply there is in a given year, say. 
And so it's the inverse of inflation, the stock to flow ratio. So right now, you know, before the halving, it was about 1.8%, I believe. Uh, right now, uh, you know, it's well under 1%. And my view is that it may have been relevant through the first two to three cycles. But once the inflation drops below 1%, it's kind of, who cares? It's so small that it doesn't influence things. Uh, right now, if you took the original stock to flow model, uh, you would have a stock to flow of 120, which corresponds to an inflation rate of 0.8%, the inverse. And if you took his original model, you would cube that, multiply it by a coefficient of 0.4, and you would have a value of something like $700,000 for Bitcoin. So it's off by more than an order of magnitude. I, I think it's fair to say that the model is broken by. Interesting. I think the, the, the parlor is also really interesting because it has those bands around it, uh, and it has a pretty big thing. Uh, wh when would you say, like, What has to happen to Bitcoin from price action that it breaks either to the upside or downside? Like, um, the, the, for like, if, if it should break in the next year, what uh, price should it reach in the upside and the downside? Maybe also get, let's get in the slides and, and see um, where it originates yeah, and, and get we'll, some explanation. We'll, we'll, we'll show, yeah, we'll show some of that and uh, I, I can talk to that. Uh, right now, the, Standard deviation is something like a multiplicative factor of 1.7, 1.74. And uh, we, we're going to see that it's asymmetrical, that you can move up two standard deviations more easily than you can move down. In fact, we've never moved down two standard deviations. And we do these in log space because it is such high volatility. So, so we'll talk to that. So maybe I should start sharing slides. Okay, power laws of Bitcoin, and a little quote from Richard Feynman about the truth being simpler than you think. And then a little comment here about how can an escrow be a power law, and I will talk about that as well. I want to talk a bit about block time, a bit about the Lindy effect, uh, which I think is some, for me, was some sort of pre-philosophical motivation about the power law. Then we'll get into the power law model and see how that's different from exponential and from compound annual growth. And we'll look at it with respect to both the dollar and to gold. And then we can look at the S-curve models. If there's time, we can talk about the Kelly criterion for position sizing. Also, I have a comparison to traditional supercomputers because Bitcoin is a decentralized global supercomputer. And then I have some commentary about Bitcoin as a special purpose AI. Okay, so I like to do my regressions in block time. And it turns out that right now there's not much difference between calendar time and block time, but they're not exactly in sync. As we know, The Bitcoin blockchain started on January 3rd, 2009, but our halvings now happen in April. And so things have not been, you know, fully in sync, but they've been relatively close. They were more out of sync in early years than they are now, but there is this offset. So there is an entire calendar system that Satoshi created and which I elucidated a bit in an article several years ago, living on Satoshi time, what block is it uh, in medium altcoin page. And it was quite necessary for him to create this uh, calendar system because everything had to be synced up. And the most critical thing is as computer technology advances, it's something like Moore's law and hash rate is advanced much faster than Moore's law. Then you had to worry about the individual block times becoming so short that the network could not be seen. So the difficulty adjustment is very, very important. And then you also have the having adjustment, of course, which is used to control the supply and to have the supply taper off and give you the very important property of having a completely finite asset, 
with the 21 million limit. So we had our most recent halving in April of this year. That was 840,000 block height. That's uh, 16 block years. So each block year is 52,500 blocks. All block months are equal length, unlike Gregorian calendar months, and they have 4375 blocks. So I like to use this as a fundamental time system for regressions. Things don't look that much different, uh, but the parallel indices sometimes look a little bit lower. So just as the Gregorian calendar has its earthly rotation and a sort of lunar rhythm and a solar rhythm, so does Satoshi's calendar, because the difficulty happens in, in sort of a lunar fashion on fortnights. So we're already in Anno Satoshi 17. Uh, the next slide, I want to talk about the Lindy effect a bit. Uh, it comes from this restaurant in Manhattan, where the comics used to hang out, and they would observe that the ones who had long runs and also the shows that had long runs in Broadway, people would keep showing up at the restaurant. And so just being at the restaurant was an indicator of this sort of Lindy effect of long life. Uh, they did not last forever. They lasted about 100 years. So they closed uh, in 2018. But this idea has been extended by others, uh, including Taleb, to the idea of persistent technology. And what you can do is you can say, what's the expected future lifetime for technology? And it's proportional to the existing lifetime. So if I say Bitcoin is 15 years old now, a little bit over, uh, 16 in block years, what's the Lindy proportion? So how much more time can we sort of assume that we have ahead of us? And so you have to come up with something as an estimator for this this p-value, this Lindy proportion. And if you just look at price gain and use that as an estimator and take some geometric mean, because the price gains are all over the map, as you know, uh, you can get an estimator that's a geometric mean of about 2.4. So from that, you say, well, it survived 15 plus years. It should have another 36 years at least ahead of us. And uh, if it makes it to 50 years, it could have another 120 ahead. So that's some of the anti-fragility of Bitcoin. But when I first started playing with the power law, I, I referred to it as this uh, sort of power law effect. So I have an astrophysics background, and Giovanni has an astrophysics background, and, of course, Fred Krueger has a math background. Why would we collectively think that you ought to try a power law model? Well, nature loves power laws. All of the four fundamental forces are indeed uh, based on power laws. Gravity is a pure one over R squared power law. Electromagnetism is a pure one over R squared power law. And there are two nuclear forces. The strong nuclear force also is one over R squared at uh, small distances. And at large distances, it has this uh, very stiff spring-like capability that keeps the quarks combined inside the protons and the neutrons. And then the last force of the four fundamental ones is the weak force. And it's got power law terms, one over R squared and also one over R. But it's also got some exponential terms because it's in decay. And this is sort of an important observation that exponentials are often associated with, with decay. And we see this when we have booms and busts in the financial markets. So I do want to show, before I show a power law, I want to show an exponential relationship. And this one is for NVIDIA. It does not show the recent uh, pullback in price because this is a data point. Uh, most recent data point was June 1st of the, this year and also 10 years prior. And this is a semi-log plot. So we've got log 10 of price uh, plotted against, you know, the year after 2000, so years 14 through 24. And it's pretty much a straight line. Uh, and it's been growing exponentially at 69% compounded. Now, before 1999, uh, sorry, before 2014, it was rather flat. It was growing at about 5% since it had gone public in 1999, but it really took off. 
as everyone knows, and it's now become basically the, you know, the most valuable uh, <clears throat> publicly traded company out there, along with Apple. We can't have this exponential continue to happen because a decade would take it to 550 trillion. And that's the equivalent of all private wealth in the world. So this is kind of a general comment on exponentials that they are unstable relative to power laws. Trees don't grow to the sky. And this is one of the reasons why I was concerned about really from the beginning about the stock to flow model, because I saw early on that it had essentially exponential behavior. That's interesting, yeah, because uh, this is the thing that I always also think, because if Bitcoin, <laughs> like Bitcoin has two things why it grows. The first thing is like the, the fiat debasement uh, in, in, in general terms, but then also uh, the adoption is just uh, growing. Like people have uh, now, I don't know how many people have Bitcoin, maybe 3%, depending on where you look, maybe 10%, whatever the adoption rate of Bitcoin is. So the ad adoption with Bitcoin uh, is growing, but then also uh, as an asset, because we get more efficient with producing things and the fiat debasement and in general. Um, so there are like some, some effects to the Bitcoin growing, but the biggest effect people just adopting it without knowing it, like uh, without, without having it prior. That's I think the, the, the biggest indicator, uh, the biggest growth factor for Bitcoin. And this will vanish at some point if, if everyone has it, uh, and then it will grow very, very slowly. It, can, it cannot grow exponentially all the, all, all the time. Yeah? Yes. Uh, you know, adoption has been growing as a power law and Giovanni realized that it was, essentially uh, Metcalf's law that was coming into effect. And Metcalf's law is the law that relates to networking, communication networks, but also to social networks. And that says that the usefulness of your telephone goes as a square of the number of other people that have telephones, right? Because now you can call many more people in the world. And this applies to social media networks as well. Now, the more people that have Facebook, the more people you can connect to potentially. So that Metcalf's law goes roughly as a square. It too can also saturate because you really don't want to talk to everybody. You just want to have <laughs> enough people to talk to. So you can sometimes get some in log in kind of behavior in there, but roughly it goes as, as a square. And we're in the early portion of the Metcalf network growth or Bitcoin. So if you take the realization and the measurement that the number of wallets and addresses been roughly growing as the cube of the time, then you find that uh, you get something like close to the six power of time growth for Bitcoin value because the network is growing. It gets a bit more complex because the fat wallets don't grow as fast as, as the wallets with, with small amounts. But basically both Moore's law that drives technology and Metcalf's law that drives communications come to play for the Bit net Bitcoin network. Yeah, what you say is uh, then uh, the 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 end of the power law, the end of the the laws where B, uh, Bitcoin is kind of fully adopted or it is almost fully adopted. Well, I, I mean the question is. Does it become the global monetary standard? And how much uh, of global wealth gets drawn into Bitcoin? And this was my motivation behind these S-curves that we'll look at in a bit. But right now, the global M2 for all currencies is $106 trillion. Uh, so... If you were to swap that all out and say, we're going to have one global monetary system, it's going to be Bitcoin, then theoretically it would be of order $100 trillion. You can support the existing GDP of the globe, which is also about $100 trillion, on a monetary network of about that value. Uh, that's In monetary theory, that's the velocity of money. <laughs> we're turning over one GDP every year. That's the definition of the velocity of money is a ratio between GDP and M2. 
Uh, now, some people are thinking, well, it's going to absorb all the wealth. But that dismisses the idea that there'll still be real estate, there'll still be companies. And you don't sell companies every year and you don't sell your real estate every year. So you can denominate those in Bitcoin. Bitcoin can be the, the most important monetary system out there. And you might not have to, have to go above $100 trillion uh, in today's dollars in equivalent. That's still a factor of 100. So we've got headroom. Yeah, 100 uh, trillion would be uh, massively. And, and of this 100 trillion, um, then there comes also inflation along, right? 100 trillion, like right. 100 X in today's terms, right? Well, under a Bitcoin standard, inflation might be very low, right? But do, do you think that uh, when we have a Bitcoin standard, there will still be fiat around? I, I don't know. It's an open question. I think we're going to see uh, these transitions take decades. The transition from the British pound to the American dollar really unfolded over decades in between World War One and, and then after World War Two in stages. And the gold standard was involved in, in that too. So I think we have to look at something that's going to proceed in stages. We don't know how it's going to unfold. Uh, We've just had introduced in the U.S. Congress the Bitcoin Strategic Reserve Bill. I don't expect that's going to pass in the next few years, but, you know, that conversation is starting. Uh, so I think uh, and then we're seeing sovereign wealth funds in the Middle East and Singapore that also have some investment in Bitcoin. We're seeing pension funds, uh, including in the U.S., for t cities and states that are starting to put uh you know, some Bitcoin as their reserve positions. So I think we see adoption growing for companies, for pension funds, for uh, sovereign wealth funds, and eventually as national treasuries. We already see that for El Salvador. Uh, we already see, uh, you know, a legal tender law for the Central African Republic. So there are going to be a bunch of stages. It's hard to know how it falls out. I think we're going to see CBDCs as well. I think Europe is very committed to CBDC. So they're going to pursue that path. And that's going to be fiat. CBDC is just another form of fiat. And uh, we'll have to see how this all develops. But I think there's an inevitability about Bitcoin that's appropriate to the conditions that we live in. It's superior monetary technology. And we have some very severe uh, debt and demographic problems. And it can be a, at least a partial solution to some of those problems. Yeah, definitely. And I see it like when, when we have Bitcoin as such a great uh, solution on, on our hand uh, and the, the field system, for me, it only has the possibility to actually worsen over time. Like, like the, the more mm -hmm. we print, the more problems arise, the more we, we have to print, uh, the, the worse just the, the monetary system gets. And we see kind of this, the US dollar is, is quite powerful. More and more countries like have to use, I think like 68 countries or something like that has the US dollar as their primary uh, mm -hmm. currency. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think smaller currencies will continue to fall. And uh, I don't know, like it, I, I don't see a world where actually at some point we only have a Bitcoin standard or a, a world where like there is only a few fiat currencies that actually are dominating. But right now we have a lot. Uh, and I don't know, it, it makes me uh, wondering if, if we ever get rid of, of fiat, because even in the Turkey or other countries where they have really high inflation, really big problems yeah. from fiat, they still use, <laughs> they still use that right, the right. Lira and, and the fiat system. So I don't know if, if people <laughs> eventually adopt Bitcoin. Governments are, are loath to give up control. So I think the, the most likely path is CBDCs, uh, competition between small countries that need to strengthen their currency because of the dominance of basically the dollar, the euro, and the yuan. And, uh, you know, as people look at it and they say, it's going up in value, we ought to have some. And so they add it at least as uh, some strategic support. 
they right now they hold foreign reserves, which are paper, which is debt, or they hold gold. And as it continues to rise against gold, which it does in a power law fashion, then they'll say, well, if we're going to hold gold, maybe we should hold some Bitcoin as well. Really cool. Yeah, I, I think so too. Um, and what's the, the Lindy power law model that you uh, have here now? <laughs> well, it's, 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 it's the power law model that you're familiar with. But uh, when I first started talking about it, I was thinking about that Lindy effect of persistence. And why do we have this power law? It's like Bitcoin just keeps going and going. And uh, what we found is it sort of settled into the power law that the power law index fluctuated during the first few years. And I'll show that on another slide. And uh, as time went on, it, it got sort of stronger, more and more anti-fragile as a power law representation. So these are the same curves, except the left is a log log curve and the right is a semi log curve. And they both show regression of price relative to the number of block years elapsed. So you can just think of it as a number of blocks on the, in the blockchain or the age in block years, as I discussed earlier. And then the, the best fit regression there is a power law index of, of 5.4. If you do it in calendar years, you get something like a 5.7 power law index. And you can see with the log log chart, it just sort of leaps out at you. Uh, the other point that's fairly clear is that the volatility is high, as we all know, if we've been in this space for, you know, even a year's time. And uh, in the semi-log version of the chart, you see a representation of that volatility. The green line and the red line have the plus one standard deviation and the minus one standard deviation. And for the whole curve, that's basically uh, just over a factor of two, a multiplicative factor of two. So if the fair value today were 60,000, one standard deviation on the upside would be 120,000, and on the downside would be 30,000, for example. And what you also observe is that you get these uh, booms and bust cycles, which have been roughly four years apart, except for the first one. And those uh, push on through the, the plus one standard deviation line, and they reach up to around two standard deviations maximum. But on the lower side, we have strong support at minus one standard deviation. And a lot of people have noticed that. And they've also noticed that, uh, you know, the, the 48 month or 200 week or four year you know, curve uh, acts as a strong support. And those are basically similar things. Uh, there's another way of doing this, which is uh, called quantile regression. The regression on the prior slide is ordinary least squares regression. But with quantile regression, what you do is you basically uh, regress so that you have levels and those levels can be you know, the highest 5%, the highest 10%, the midline at 50%, the lowest 5%, the lowest 10%. And it <clears throat> finds the optimal fit such that 5% of the data points are below the line and 95% are above. Or if it's the midline, 50% of the data points are above, 50 below. But it is linear in log price versus uh, log of age. And again, this is using... Uh, block years. And I give the equations as well. So again, on the left side, we've got the log log chart. On the right side, we have the same set of seven curves on the semi log chart. And we've also got extrapolations out. With the log log chart, I show the extrapolation out to 50 years of age, which would be 2059. And on the semi log chart, I show it out to 30 years of age, which would be uh, Roughly 2039, these are block years, so it happens uh, slightly faster than that, about a year faster. And we get the same sort of results. Uh, basically, if you look at the midline, which turns out to be uh, basically the median, 
regression, then you find that it has a power law with index 5.44, which is similar to the least squares regression. But then if you look at these uh, support levels, which are the 0.05 quantile, the 0.1 quantile, and even the 0.25 quantile, which are the three lines, you know, at the bottom in red and blue and what's the other one? It's a green line. They're almost on top of each other. You see, they're all very close together and they provide a lot of support similar to that minus one on the Z index or minus one standard deviation we saw before. And those have a roughly a 5.6 to 5.7 power law index. And then if we look at the tops that are connected at uh, 0.9 quantile and 0.95, it's roughly a 5.0 power law index connecting the top. So that's suggesting to you that the volatility is coming down somewhat, that these uh, boom and bust cycles are not peaking quite as high as we go from one cycle to the next. And where would we, uh, like, that's the, <laughs> that is probably a question that mo- most people then ask when we saw this power law and we saw lower, lower quali- uh, <laughs> quality, uh, volatility. Uh, over time, uh, you said like 2049 was the one model. That's like 25 years from from now. If I'm I'm not cor- I'm not uh, I'm uh, mistaken. Well, one of these extrapolates out to 30 block years, which is 2038, basically, and that's the one uh, on the right hand side. That's the log versus uh, linear time chart. So it's 2038, so that's like uh, yeah, yeah. Eight, 15 years, more like that. Uh, 14 years, 14 years out, out in, in the future. Yeah, it's another 14 years. That's correct. What, what would you say is, is um, with, with the power law, with the linear power law model and all those those things combined, what would you say is a realistic price target as an average for, for that time frame? Um. It, it's going to be about what's well, going to be above a million dollars. So you'll see that the midline, which is in the cyan color, is around $2 million. With, and the, the support line is around $1 million. Interesting. There's also um, Michael Saylor is not, I feel like not, that famous for making price prediction, but he actually made one uh, at at the Bitcoin Nashville, like the, the first time that I saw him actually making bull bear and 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 thin case. Otherwise, he all only more talked about yeah, it could go to that trillion of market cap, but he never really put <laughs> like a time and and a value to it. And I think his base bear case was like three million at uh, year twenty forty five, and his bull case was forty nine million. It, which is a big bandwidth also. Um, would, yes. would that uh, the Paolo also, uh, is, would that the Paolo also suggest in that bandwidth? He, he, yes, I, I checked that. His, mid, his midpoint was 13 million for 2045. And he didn't quite expose all the details of his model, but his model basically had the growth rate coming down over time, which is what happens with the power law. And so it almost sounded as if he was using something that was qualitatively similar to power law. So he had 13 million for the midpoint. Uh, I would regress to 9 million. So, you know, it's in the ballpark of, of 10 million. Yeah, I think. And with the, with the wide band. Now, he, he used a band that's more than a factor of three. Uh, so he gave himself, you know, a lot of leeway. I think that's not unreasonable, but it's a bit, you know, it just depends on, do you choose the 95% or the 99% contours? I, I think if you choose the, the one sigma contours that you would say, you know, a factor of less than two. So it would be something like on the upside, you know, less than 20 million for the one sigma, but if you go to two sigma, which you do when you get, you know, a boom, these exponential runaways, uh, then it 
then it could get up to that value that he suggested. On the downside, you might not be lower than, say, $5 million. That might be your support. Mm, yeah. It's also interesting I, that you mentioned that in the power law that the, the, the lower bands are more um, uh, uh, more reliable, like the, the, the how do you call it, resistant, uh, the support uh, line is, is more uh, reliable and it breaks a little bit more to the upside. Uh, do you expect that to continue, right. the bottom? Yeah, uh, yes. I mean, I, the, the, the core of the power law is in the support. What we're really seeing is we're seeing a power law that has superimposed on it exponential bubbles. And those exponential bubbles are driven by these quasi-periodic four-year cycles that, you know, historically people thought, oh, that relates to the halving. Other people have said it relates to business cycles. It seems to be driven a lot by liquidity. Uh, people have talked about election cycles, but of course that's one country, right? So that can't drive necessarily the global behavior, but it does it does reflect in the behavior of the most important central bank. And uh, there is some correlation between liquidity cycles and, you know, the election cycle in the U S. So uh, right now, in fact, we see that the central banks are pretty well coordinated in terms of their interest rate policies, except for Japan, they're an outlier, but uh, most of the other central banks are, now heading, you know, or either cutting or heading towards cutting interest rates. So like the, the election cycle actually has uh, an indirect uh, impact in, in that. Is, do you think is it, it's it's coincidence that the election cycle is, is, is paired with the Bitcoin cycle uh, to, to some extent? Uh, I don't think it's a complete coincidence, but we don't have enough data points to have statistical confidence. It's, it's interesting for me, like the, yeah. all those memes. Also, you mentioned uh, like there are so many memes in, in Bitcoin and it makes it real fun. Um, you also had on one uh, on one slide has been ex exponentially since then at 69% uh, compounded. Uh, it's, 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 it's crazy that we, we hit those uh, meme numbers at 69 or 420 sometimes yeah. in Bitcoin. <laughs> I, you know, that was NVIDIA, <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's true, true, true. <laughs> Perfect, then, yeah, sobering part, but more physical than, uh, that, that sounds fun. Yeah, so, look, the, S, the stock to flow says you're going to compound at 69% forever. And, uh, you know, between uh, Giovanni and Fred and, seen a 21st capital and APS K 32. We don't believe that we believe in the power law and the power law has a behavior where you double when you double the amount of time. So, you know, the first factor two could happen as you went from one year to two years, but the next, you know, factor of whatever requires going from two to four years and then from four to eight and then from eight to 16. Now we're getting a lot more than a factor of two. We're getting, as you double the time scale, we're getting about two to the 5.7 in calendar years. And that's more like a factor of 50. So you double the age of Bitcoin and you'll get a factor of 50. You double it again, you'll get a factor of 50. But you had to go from eight to 16 years or eight to you know, seven and a half to 15 years to get one factor of 50. Now you've got to go from age 15 to age 30 to get the next factor of 50. So sorry to say the compound annual growth rate is going down. But you can calculate directly from the power law what that expected gain in the fair value is over time. And it's in the third bullet. And it's just B block years plus one divided by B. So if I'm at 16 block years now, I add one, I take the ratio 17 to over 16, I raise that to the power of K, which is about 5.4, and I find it's 39% for the next block year. And then I find for the year after, you know, it's a slightly smaller number, 37% and so forth. 
So it's slowing, but it is still a phenomenal return. And as you know, it's much better than anything we're getting from NASDAQ and from S&P or from European stocks, etc. It's really interesting for me when, because I come from the stock world, uh, I come from uh, stock investing and picking stocks. And this was a lot of fun for me, uh, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And it, it returned a lot of uh, gains. Uh, but I realized that Bitcoin is right now the, the, the from a risk reward basis, just the, the best bet I can take for the next couple, five, maybe 10 years. But I think at some point we will come to the point of Bitcoin being mature enough that there might be an incentive to go out with my time again and find amazing companies that I can invest. There is also the incentive to do that now. There might be companies that outgrow uh, Bitcoin. But right now, my focus fully on, on Bitcoin, that might change in 10, 20 years. So... Is, is, would you say, is there, is there a point where you say like Bitcoin from an investment standpoint and not just saving? Because right now it's kind of, we always say like Bitcoin is saving, but it's also getting mm -hmm. adopted so quickly so that it's, it kind of makes sense as a uh, future bet as an in investment vehicle. Where would you say is the, the point where the, the returns are diminishing so much that it is still the best form of money, the best form of uh, saving your financial energy, but it makes sense to allocate something for investing back in something with more risk, uh, like stocks, like something else. Is, is there, did you have, do you have a framework around that? Sure, it's the power law. <laughs> so all we have to do is we just, you know, we just, plug in the time ratio, raise it to that power. Uh, or a simple way to look at it is you just take one plus one over the age of Bitcoin. You take that quantity, one plus one over the age of Bitcoin, and raise it to the power K, which in calendar years is, is you know, 5.7. So, you know, pick a year in the future, let's say 2040. So in 2040, Bitcoin will be 31. So all we have to do is divide one into 31, add one, we've got 1.032. And we raise that to the 5.7 power. And we get a return of 19.8% per annum. So if you think you can do better than that with stock picking, then you might start doing some stock picking again in that time frame. But we're going to be above 20% for another 15 years. And that's amazing. Uh, 20 years, uh, 20 percent, depending right. on like if, in, if if you don't have hype inflation, but then the power laws like gets up. Is 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 that a, a thing when we uh, we have a scenario where like the US dollar or like the world is getting into like a hyper inflation um, scenario situation where where the power law mm. kind of breaks because then we have mm. an, an extreme situation. It's possible, certainly. I mean, if if you had steady inflation above 10%, moderate, even moderate hyperinflation, then you might see the power law index uh, steepen, right? Because Bitcoin should go up more if the dollar is depreciating faster. And one way to get a feel of that is to look at gold also, which we'll do in another chart. The, in, the intent here is that uh, this is useful as long as the expected fair value gain is much larger than the inflation. And what we know is that, you know, decade after decade, the U.S. M2 money supply grows at about 7% per year. So as long as we've got an expected return that's in the 30 percentiles or 20 percentiles, it's much, much larger and that inflation is a second order effect. But if that inflation, you know, were consistently 
12, 15, 18% for some reason, uh, then you, you'd expect to see the return in dollar terms to be even higher. Uh, but what we do expect also is that Bitcoin is going to continue to get, and gold would do well, right? Potentially under such a scenario. It should at least hold its value roughly over long time frames. But we would expect Bitcoin to continue to do better than gold because it's attracting more and more people into the network. And we're getting that benefit of the network effect of Metcalf's law. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash Robin to get your Bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship set up you have to talk to the bitcoin way if you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Looking at uh, the gold instead of US dollars uh, from a power law perspective. I don't think I'll dwell on this too long. This is these are the Z scores. So this is the number of standard deviations above and below. We sort of talked about this a bit already. Uh, this only goes back about 10 years, so it's not showing the, the first six years. So we're seeing the two large peaks that happened after the second halving at year block year eight and after the third halving at block year 12, where we had sort of a double peak. And in both cases, you know, it peaked out with Z-scores around two or two standard deviations upward. And it also bottomed in three instances at slightly less than minus one Z-score, minus one standard deviation on the downside. So what we say is we have convexity because we have a highly favorable risk to reward ratio, uh, more upside than downside, right? Well, what's the what's the Z-score? Sorry to... Uh, Z is just the number of standard deviations above or below trend. And again, the standard deviations are measured logarithmically. Uh, so the, see if I have the number here, uh, multiplicatively, one standard deviation is a factor of 1.74 multiplicatively. But in log 10 terms, it's a value of about, I think, 0.253. So in other words, will be, the log of the price will either be 0.25 below or 0.25 above in long terms. Or if it goes to Z-score of two, it'll be 0.5 above. And 0.5 above is a factor of three. So the price might drop by a factor of 1.7, but it might go up to Z equals two, which is a factor of 1.7 squared higher. So quite a bit more headroom. And this particular time, uh, when I did this, the model trend was at 60,000. And then, so the downside price was 29,000, but the upside price was 211,000. And that's not so different from where we are now. We're, we have a somewhat similar situation now. This was updated to, I think, a month ago. So, so it, it's kind of. Uh, there's another one. Yes. So it's kind of shows the, the the volatility of of it. it. It shows the volatility, and it also shows the skew to the right tail. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So any, you know, you spend uh, 
you notice you'll spend a lot of time around zero, between point, minus 0 0.5 and 0.5, and you'll actually spend more time hugging the minus one line than you'll spend at the 0.2 peaks. But you have those peaks available to you, and you have uh, a fair number of data points between 1.0 and 2.0. And that's when, you know, the price gets quite extended. But those, that's when it's in the exponential phase, and those bubbles are also unsustainable for very long. There's another way of looking at it, and APSK32 has, has promoted this view. And you can look at things in terms of lead and lag. Uh, so how many years or months does price lead or lag the main trend of the parallel model. So, for example, on July 31st, when the price was up at 66,000, a little bit higher than it is today, and I'm, I'm kind of glad we're having this on a, a crash day because I want everybody to think in log terms, not in linear terms, and to look at these uh, charts and graphs, particularly the log log graphs, and then you can calm down a bit. You'll see that. In long, long terms, the price hasn't moved all that much. But just a few days ago, uh, when we were 66,000, we were ahead of the model by about 3.7 months. And this chart with the zigzag shows the number of block years ahead or behind that you are. And you find it can go as much as three years ahead when you get into the bubbles, or it can be as much as a year or more uh, lagging. If I look I right look now, it looks like we're, with our little crash that we've had down to around 53,000, I'm not sure what the very latest price is, we're about uh, five months lagging right now. So we're below the trend value for the regression in block years. Interesting. And just a quick note, because we are uh, recording now on August 5th on, on a Monday, uh, at least for me now on my in, in my time zone. Uh, so it, it will be probably released on Saturday uh, this week. Mm -hmm. So in, in six days, <laughs> maybe, maybe the uh, price, is all, <laughs> price already made some other moves. Let's see. Maybe it's mm -hmm. a crazy week in, in ahead of us. Uh, but it's uh, it's interesting. So like at the current price rate, 53,000 or what we have, we are lagging, so it, it would be kind of a buy signal, but it's, it's like if you really believe in Bitcoin, <laughs> also three months ahead is a buy signal. <laughs> Correct. It, I, I think that's exactly the right way to look at it. So we've got a better buy today than we had on July 31st. But, you know, as long as your time horizon is more than four months, you are still, uh, you know, reasonable to buy on July 31st. And then there's a histogram and it shows the distribution. And what you find is, you know, you have this right tail. So you have uh, some data points with leads of two to three or more years, but the lag, you know, never exceeds two years and rarely exceeds one and a half years. So that's another example for the skew. A short, short question um, here. Um, yes. Is there some uh, website or some somewhere where we, you can so like uh, there we can see if, if we are lagging or, or leading? I think that's an interesting uh, yeah. method to look at for, for people. I would follow APSK32 for that because he's been posting on that on his uh, Twitter account. And he's doing it in calendar years. I do it in block years, but you'll see roughly similar results. And, you know, I will occasionally tweet about it. I tweeted something about it today. Uh, I will occasionally put an article on, on Twitter or in Substack about these things. Really cool. Thank you. So the, the next slide is does Bitcoin behave as an exponential or a power law? So this is just further data support for the fact that indeed uh, it's a power law. We do have returns that come down over time. 
and we do have uh, volatility that comes down over time. That's a model free statement. And what I've done is I've just taken for the four epics that we had to block year four, block year eight, 12, and, and now 16, which was the having in April. I've said, what was the average monthly return by epic? And you can see that it dropped from 30% in the first epic down to below 10% in the completed fourth epic. We're now in the fifth epic. And the volatility, this is the standard deviation in that epic of monthly returns, dropped from 80% down to about 25%. So it's both have come down substantially. If you had exponential return, constant compound annual growth, both lines would be straight. And in re re reality, they both fell monotonically and considerably. And I can model the standard deviation, what that should be with the parallel as well. If I make some assumptions about some contribution from the bubbles as well, some basically something that looks like a diffusion equation. So I've, I've got an article on that. The next thing is on gold. So this is uh, a semi-log graph. This is uh, the log of the number of Bitcoin required to buy one ounce of gold. So this is instead of uh, increasing, it's decreasing. With time, it's showing how gold has dropped against Bitcoin. It's the inverse of Bitcoin priced in gold ounces. This one is plotted in calendar years. It also fits a power law faster than the fifth power of time. In fact, starting from when Bitcoin was two years old until now, it's a power law of five and a half. So gold has been falling as, you know, T to the minus 5.5, or Bitcoin has been rising as T to the 5.5 over this time frame. So it's another way of validating it because people have often asked, well, what about inflation? Um, yes, if you compare it to the Argentine peso, things might look weird, you know. But that's because of the Argentine peso. You're not comparing it to a real standard of value. And what we're doing in investing is we're wanting to com compare the real standards of value. And that principally, those are the strongest currencies and, and gold. When would that power law suggest that Bitcoin uh, gets to a gold market uh, cap? This this uh, flippening of, of, of gold from a Bitcoin uh, standpoint? Right. Um, well, you, we have to go by a factor of, I don't know where we are today, probably 1.1 trillion and gold is around 15 trillion. We have to go up by a factor of 14. Now, in the next two years, we'll increase by about a factor of two and the following two years, close to a factor of two. Then it'll take about three years to go another factor of two. And then another three years, about another factor of two. So we'll, in a decade, we'll get a factor of about 16. Uh, so if gold goes up modestly, we should match gold in about a decade. So around like early 2030s, interesting. Mid, yeah, early early to mid. You know, I would say it's reasonable by, by 2035. If we persist on this parallel, we'll match gold. Yeah, because I think a lot of people, uh, they, they look at the Bitcoin price and they're like, oh, we, we will hit gold's market cap at this price point. But then they don't realize that gold is also a hard asset, uh, inferior to Bitcoin, mm -hmm. but still a hard asset uh, compared to the US dollar. So gold will also move up in market cap alongside with Bitcoin and, and gold market cap is kind of like an, a moving target and people are like, oh no, go, Bitcoin will outperform gold in like a one year or two years or like five right. years. And 
yeah, it could happen. Like uh, it's, it's. I, I think it, it's not impossible, but I think it's like the the decade out. I feel like it's way more realistic because gold is still a moving target. Yes, and so the power law is slightly lower. You know, if we do the regression calendar years for dollars, we'll get about five point seven, and here for gold, we get about five point five. Now you could get a bubble. You know, it depends also on the timing of your bubbles. So if the bubbles peak in 2025 and then 2029 and then 2033, that 2033 bubble could very well take us over gold. But then we might, you know, fall below it again for a year or so when we have a crypto winner. Excuse me, a Bitcoin winner. <laughs> <laughs> the bad word crypto. Trump said it too. The, the, Trump said it too often. <laughs> yeah, no one's ever said Bitcoin winner. I've never seen anybody say Bitcoin winner, but I think we need to start using that phrase. Okay, so the next uh, slide is this idea of uh, S curve. And when I start first started looking at S curves, I look. You know, everybody looks at these logistic curves. And it's a really poor fit. It's really bad. And and when I looked at it, it was, yeah, it's probably five years ago. I think that's when I started playing with these Weibull curves, four or five years ago. And I know within the past year, uh, both Fred Kruger and, and Giovanni looked at the logistic curves as well and said, yeah, that's really, those don't fit at all, really bad. But I stumbled on the Weibull cumulative distribution function and it has this interesting form. Now, the power law is a two-parameter model. It's basically a power law index, which is the steepness of the power law, and then a normalization, you know, at, at what time did you cross $1,000 or just a coefficient in front of the equation, you know. The, the Weibull function uh is a fraction of some ultimate value. So in the first bullet point, I write F equals one minus an exponential of minus T over C to the K power. Well, the K power is analogous to the power law index. It's a scale factor. The C is a time scale, a characteristic time scale. And then when F goes to one asymptotically because as time goes on, exponential to a minus something to a power shrinks and pretty quickly. And so we get one minus zero, F goes to one. Well, so you have to normalize this thing to some asymptotic value. It could be price, it could be market cap. I chose it to be market cap because it kind of made more sense to say, would it saturate at the value of all gold or would it saturate at the value of all M2 or would it saturate at the value of, you know, real estate or global wealth? And since we don't know and it's well into the future, there's a lot of uncertainty. I originally ran models at every half decade, 1 trillion, 3 trillion, 10 trillion, 30 trillion, and 100 trillion. The 1 trillion model we can forget about. We already passed that one. Uh, and here I've shown the graphs for an ultimate market cap of 30 trillion. And you should think of these in, you know, inflation corrected. So think of these in 2024 $20, dollars and then a hundred trillion, which would be like all M2. So the, the 30 trillion is like double the gold total value of gold in the world. And then the hundred trillion is like an M2. And what you see is in both cases, the curves look like the same. Now, the horizontal, the x-axis is log or block year, just like these other charts I've showed you. But the vertical axis is something different. It's this thing called y that we'll show you in the next slide. It's actually a double logarithm. <clears throat> so I won't go through all the math here. But what you have to do is you have to take the log of that f. You take the log of 1 minus f. And then you take the log of that thing again. So it's a double logarithm. And once you do that, you've got something that's linearized and you can do a regression, just a typical AX plus B kind of regression. And then you can pull out these two parameters, K and C. Again, C is the characteristic time scale. In this case, it's a time until you get 
to some fraction, and it's always the same fraction for all of these curves. They're self-similar of the asymptotic market cap. And it turns out to be a number that's about 63%. And you can think of it as the knee of the curve. So when do I hit the knee of the curve and I start saturating? And the other is this scale parameter. And you can think of it as analogous to the power law index. And in the next uh, slide, I have a table that compares the power law to this Weibull function for the 3 trillion case, the 10 trillion case, and all the way up to 100 trillion case. And we see in the first column after that, we see this K-shape parameter, and it's the same. They're all 6.0. So it's saying that the power law says market cap grows as the sixth power, and it's true whether you know I'm going to saturate at 10 trillion or 100 trillion. What's different is the time scale. Uh, it might be 18 years to the knee in the three trillion case. It might be 33 years to the knee in the 100 trillion case. And that's measured from when Bitcoin began. So the 100 trillion case, the characteristic time scale would take you out to 2042, roughly, as when you'd be hitting the knee of the curve. So what you want is you want this to keep, <laughs> you want this to be a long time scale because that's consistent with going to a higher ultimate uh, market cap. You can see they all have the same R squared of 0.96, basically. And they all have uh, similar F values for the F test, 3,600, basically. And, uh, you know, the saturation could be 2026 or it could be 2041. Now, that first row, that year for the power law, that's not saying it's going to saturate. The power law goes up forever, right? Um and so it does have that defect in a sense of, you know, ultimately it's going to reach all wealth in the world if you keep staying on the power law and, or everybody's going to be onboarded, right? You're going to have 5 billion adults that have Bitcoin wallets. And so at some point it's going to saturate and that's some of the motivation. And then the ultimate price, uh, sorry, the price I give is the price at the knee. So, in other words, in 2026, with the three trillion, you would reach a knee at 100,000. With 30 trillion, you'd reach a knee at 2035 and around a million bucks. The takeaway from this is that you don't need to use the Weibull yet. You don't need to use an S-curve model because statistically, you can't differentiate it from a pure power law. So the power law is working quite well. We're not close to the knee. And it looks uh, quite persistent and that it should run quite well for the next decade or longer. It's, it's interesting. Um, when we now hypothetically think about Bitcoin and Bitcoin might uh, always uh, get more and more um, valuable because hum humanity expands. If we think of mm -hmm. like if we expand to other planets and, and, and really futuristic stuff like that, then if we can also take to those planets a Bitcoin with us and we have not only Earth as a, a full market cap but a total addressable market for Bitcoin, but we have other planets, maybe even other species mm -hmm. uh, to, 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 use, uh, to use a Bitcoin, then the power law could actually grow indefinitely, right? Well, I think we're going to, yes. I mean, look, a lot of people think AI is going to cause growth to accelerate for the globe, right? So I think we have uh, AI as something that's a more imminent possibility than planetary exploration. It's going to take many decades to get a lot of people out onto the moon and Mars. And they're going to be dependent on the Earth for quite some time. Uh, so we're not going to have huge economies on Mars even in the next several decades. Also, by the way, you can't do Bitcoin mining on Mars. It's too far away. Uh, you can do it on the moon, but Mars averages 12 light minutes, so you can't sink on the blockchain. So you'd have to mine something else or mint something else. But you can certainly use Bitcoin, and it makes a lot of sense for it to be a planetary currency as well as a global currency. 
but you'd end up using second layer. Or you could hold a Bitcoin wallet, but it's it's not a productive place to do mining on Mars. And also it costs way too much. You the equipment, you know, the equipment is obsolete in three years, right? And you cannot afford to the cost to lift a heavy miner up to the moon. The economics just don't work, right? Even for the moon. <clears throat> so forget about Bitcoin mining on the moon, even. But use Bitcoin uh, for planetary exploration. That's fine, and that could be second layer lightning or other, or that you know that could be base <clears throat> base blockchain Bitcoin as well. And so the question is, I think that's more relevant is what will AI do? Will we get a big boost in the economy? Uh, we certainly expect we're going to see a big boost in Bitcoin usage from AI. Because how else do robots and AI exchange value with each other? They don't have bank accounts. They don't have credit cards. But they will have access to Bitcoin. And Lightning Sats in particular are very, very useful because they're going to want to do a lot of microtransactions very, very rapidly. And these AIs are going to need to go out and buy data or share data or negotiate for data and purchase data from other AIs, from other bots, or they may need other resources. And this is before we even talk about all the security aspects, the software aspects as well. So I, yes, I think we could see a big acceleration in economic growth as we have uh, many more pseudo humans uh, manufacturing real goods. Uh, that, that, that would be really Really interesting to see AI using Bitcoin. I mean, it's the obvious choice as you described it, uh, because what else will they use? They cannot open a bank account. Uh, and AI, with all the information they have, they, they will figure out that Bitcoin is the most reliable asset to have and to count on if, if, if AI is actually determining what asset should I build something on. It will determine, uh, as I think, uh, Bitcoin and not <laughs> some altcoin or something else to, to, yeah. to use. And also, you don't want a rogue actor to grab control of your AI or your robot. And so one way of, you know, enforcing some additional security is to require sats coming into a port, right? And you might even say those sats have to come from wallets with certain addresses. And that's the only way you can send those in. That's very interesting. Exchange value. Yeah. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is how much Bitcoin should you own? <laughs> and this depends on your time frame. If you're a degenerate trader, <laughs> you might not want to hold as much of your wealth as if you're a long-term investor or a long-term saver. And this comes from application of the Kelly criterion uh, to you know Bitcoin performance over different time scales. Uh, the Kelly criterion is well established to maximize the growth and the logarithm of your wealth and to be an optimal strategy. And in the simplest case, you have a two asset portfolio. So here we've just compared Bitcoin and U.S. dollars. And uh, you, you can correct if you want for T-bill rates or not. But over these time frames, T-bill rates were generally not very high, so it doesn't make much difference what you do. And the Kelly Criterion formula says the fraction you should invest equals the percentage of times that you win in a give, for your given time interval. So what you have to do is you have to choose a time interval. Are you going to make daily trades or monthly trades or quarterly or yearly? Or how often are you going to rebalance? You know, if you're getting into quarterly and yearly, what you're talking about is rebalancing your portfolio. How often are you going to make a decision in what percentage of your portfolio you hold in Bitcoin? So that becomes your time frame. And so the percentage of wins or how many monthly wins you have or quarterly wins or yearly wins. Q is just one minus P. It's just the percentage of time that you have losses. And B is the ratio of the average win size to the average loss size. And the more conservative 
gambler's formula, which actually more conservative than the investment formula for the Kelly criterion, says P minus Q over B. So I divide my loss by the average win size outperformance, which is a ratio of, you know, if I win twice as much as when I lose, and the skew of Bitcoin is very helpful there. You know, if we've got downside to 30,000, but we've got upside to well over 120,000 and maybe 200,000, you know, then B can be several times as large as one. And so we're dividing our loss percentage by B and making that smaller. And so we're subtracting less from the allocation. So I've tabulated this for a monthly series that was five years, a quarterly series that was five years. And the optimal F was 24%. But if you go to quarterly, you want to hold more, 35%. And then if you take all years since 2011, 14 years, including a partial year for 2024, you want to hold 77%. Now, you might think the first five years or six years were kind of excessive, and you might realize with the parallel returns are slowing. So if you want to just look for the last five or six years from 2018, then it says of a two-asset portfolio with just cash and Bitcoin, you would want to hold about maximally 55, 56%. I did all this in Excel, but I also recently ran it through ChatGPT and I asked ChatGPT the same question. It also said 77% for that, including all years since 2011. So that's uh, confirmation on that. It's interesting. So, uh, so uh, I mean, <laughs> um, someone like me that is just so like like there's a lot of factors uh, coming into play uh, when, when you when you think about like what what how how many percentage of your net worth uh, should you put in in Bitcoin? I myself, I'm like. 25 years old. I don't have a lot to lose. Uh, I have a lot to gain from, from Bitcoin. Uh, and I don't have uh, kids. I don't have a family. Uh, I don't have employees that count on me or something like that. Um, in, that in, in that sense, my risk tolerance <laughs> is really high because even if Bitcoin goes to zero and all my income tomorrow goes to zero, like both my wealth and my income is going to zero tomorrow, I'm still kind of fine uh, i i have yeah. uh, two different parent houses where i can can go and, and live <laughs> uh I, I i can i'm a software developer i can go somewhere and find some some good job in in, in that regard so um that's why my risk, risk crawling is really high my percentage is that's why that my my percentage is is because of that really close to 100 <laughs> Uh, right, right. Uh, but so there's always <clears throat> also this factor for me coming in but th this isn't i never heard about that kind of model i actually like a uh, math, math model to find out the right percentage mm -hmm. for you yes and there are you know there are websites where you can go and play with other models and there's a wide variation of what the models will predict uh <clears throat> if you use the investment formula for the kelly criteria and you take the whole not the whole price history, but most of the price history, it will also get you up to to very high numbers. In fact, uh, in some cases, it'll get you over 100% saying you should leverage, you know. Uh, <clears throat> for myself, I'm about close to three times as old as you are. I've got two young children. Um, I've got, you know, retirement income, a little bit of real estate holding. Uh, but I'm still heavily invested because of all this, you know, that I've done. And this tells me you need, you need a high percentage fraction if, if you want to pay for your kid's education. Right? So I'm, I'm thinking it from the legacy side of things as well. Uh, but what people want to do really depends on their individual circumstances. I think I would just encourage people to you know to not think that uh one or two percent or five percent is going to be life altering that they need maybe they should study a bit more yeah you're going to start that way you know you're going to gain comfort 
uh, hopefully you will gain comfort and, and start to put more in as you do that. But you have to have long time horizon. And the reason why it's not 100% with the Kelly criterion is it's a very volatile. So you've got to learn how to be comfortable and sleep at night with that volatility. And the I think, it's also, fortitude. Uh, I think it's also like an educational educational game, educational um, question. Uh, I needed around uh, one weekend really study, like I needed three years before, three years I needed to get across like Bitcoin is a scam. Like I had three years where I thought Bitcoin is a scam and mm -hmm. then I needed one weekend to like, oh, Bitcoin might be something. So I switched from Bitcoin is a scam to Bitcoin might be interesting because I actually started researching the, the thing and not just reading, <laughs> reading headlines. So, th so that's the first step for me. Um, yeah. And I needed like, I don't know, like a month or so to get like a significant amount of my portfolio, like around, around 5% uh, to really allocate to Bitcoin. Then in that, summa another year, I was almost all in already. Like I, mm -hmm. I, I just went down the rabbit hole with information education and I kind of was like, oh, it's not Bitcoin. It is like, uh, I don't want to hold anything else. Like uh, when you're young, then is the time where you make uh, bigger bets. And I feel like Bitcoin is the best right. bet I can take for the, for the future. Yes. It's great. Absolutely. Yeah. Then let's, uh, we're already at one and a half hours, but I want to continue because there are a lot of interesting topics coming, uh, uh, upon us. Uh, if you still have time, because I know that, uh, initially okay. are perfect and let's it, continue. Yeah, we, we can keep going for a little while. It's just really a couple more slides, I think. So this next one is about supercomputing. So I spent three decades in the supercomputer industry. You know, I started out in astrophysics and research, uh, postdoc for a few years, and then I switched to the supercomputing field uh, and was in that, you know, through the 80s, the 90s, and the aughts until uh, quasi-retiring and moving into technology consulting, you know, in 2011. Um, so there is something in the supercomputer world called the top 500 list. And it gets produced twice a year. And there are two big supercomputer conferences. One is held in the U.S. every November. And one is held in Germany every uh, May or June. And this is a table that I produced in the time frame for the last uh, of those conferences in Germany. Uh, I did not attend, but I'm going to attend the one in, uh, which is going to be held in Atlanta in November, the Supercomputing 24, and I will present an updated version of this uh, to, you know, people in the supercomputing community at that time. So what we have in the first two columns is the supercomputing world, you know, after, well, the second and third column, but the first two after the the uh, category column. And what we have in the last two columns is, is the Bitcoin world. Now, on this top 500 list, which is the 500 fastest computers in the world, and they basically use a math problem. It's a big system of linear equations and solve that. And that's how they get the performance measure. And they're up in the exaflop space. So the top 500, if you combine all machines, it's eight exaflops. And we all know, you know, because we have exahashes, we all know exa is a million trillion, right? Uh, or 10 to the 18th. So it's eight times 10 to the 18th, and a flop is a floating point operation. If you take the fastest computer in the world, which is a computer at one of the Department of Energy labs, it alone is 1.2 times 10 to the 18th floating point operations per second. Uh, the number one position only went up by 9% since the prior year, but if you take the aggregate of the top 500, it's increasing at a Moore's law kind of thing where you double every couple of years and it went up by 57%. That uh, one top machine has uh, 38,000 uh, AMD GPU chips along with 9,500 AMD CPUs. 
and it requires 74 cabinets, power consumption of 23 megawatts, weight 300 tons, it costs 600 million, it does science, and its value is priceless. So I said, well, we don't know exactly what the Bitcoin network consists of, but what if we model it by the latest and greatest machine and assume that, you know, uh, as a Gedanken experiment, a thought experiment, if we replaced the entire hash rate with the latest high-end what's minor 63S hydro system, what would it take? One cabinet holds a dozen of those what's minors, and it produces 4.7 petahashes. And it's 50% faster than the earlier generation, you know, a year ago. So this is one cabinet. It has a power consumption of 90 kilowatts, a weight of three quarters of a metric ton. It costs $100,000. And its output, since the halving, is roughly 1.3 Bitcoin per year, worth, you know, 90,000 more or less. If we wanted to reproduce the entire network at the time I produced this report, a little less than 600 exahash, that had gone up by the same 57% since a year ago. And you would require one and a half million ASICs. Now, we know that, you know, most of the ASICs out there are slower than this. So this already tells us that there are probably at least three million and maybe five million ASICs that are actively mining at any one time to produce that hash rate. But if it were all these machines, you would need 124,000 cabinets. Your power consumption would be 11 gig gigawatts. Your weight would be 95,000 metric tons. The cost would be 13 billion. You would produce 164,000 Bitcoin per year. And the value of that would be something like 11, 12 billion per year. So it costs you 13 billion for that equipment, but that depreciates over a cycle of maybe three years, four years. And then you've got your electricity cost and hopefully you're making money. Uh, so this is really to show this, this supercomputing world that has not really thought that this much about it, that Bitcoin is a generalized global supercomputing network and that it has comparable investment as is going into these top 500 supercomputers. It's certainly using roughly comparable power to that whole network. And it is producing very significant value. And of course, when people could critique the electricity consumption of Bitcoin on ESG grounds, they always get it wrong because they always compare to the number of transactions produced and they talk about how much electricity and the cost of that electricity per transaction. But that's only a few percent of what's going on. What's happening is you're producing permanent value. That electricity is going into producing permanent and increasing value. And every analyst gets this wrong. So this is the other point that I'm trying to make here. Oh, I would you suggest the the I think with with supercomputers, um, I said for like quantum quantum computers is also a, a term that comes up in that discussion often. Then where we were like, what what's the what's the threat of some alien super quantum computer coming out and breaking the the hashes of of Bitcoin and breaking the security of of Bitcoin? Um, do mm -hmm. we have to upgrade the, the Bitcoin network at some point to, to be more resistant against that? Or how do you look at that? Well, the, 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 the main threat is from Shor's algorithm. Uh, all the banking system runs on, you know, elliptical uh, cryptography and, you know, uses a lot of that class of cryptography for uh, their systems. So there's some threat to the wallets. One has to have some concern about the wallets themselves, but that's not the same as the blockchain. So the Shores, the quantum algorithm called Shores algorithm that's been developed 
might be able to crack the wallets, but it doesn't crack the blockchain. It doesn't crack hashing. And there's not a known quantum algorithm for cracking a hash chain. Uh, there's already, you know, proposed quantum cryptography standard that's been approved by National Institute of Science, uh, NIST, National Institute of Science, uh, Standards and Technology. And, uh, you know, that's something that may be required to, to roll out to wallets. It's probably still a decade away just for that side of things. Uh, people are getting prepared. Uh, and this affects all of, you know, fintech as well. Yeah, I think then, the, the, me... the blockchain being rolled back, uh, there's nothing on the horizon for hashing, for quantum hashing. Nothing that I know of. Now, I'm not a cryptographic expert, but I haven't, haven't seen anything. Also, the things that I usually hear is, is going in, in, in that direction. Really cool. Thank you. I think this is my last slide. Yeah? Um, I maintain that Bitcoin is a special purpose AI. And for the five reasons I give along the left-hand side of this slide, the first is that it's a logical system of self-executing protocols. The second is that we have a decentralized persistent network. The third, very importantly, it's a catalyst for human behavior. We see this Metcalf law for network behavior, like we see in communication networks and social networks, that's governing Bitcoin adoption. We see as a fourth point, emergent and resilient network behavior. And in the fifth, we see that it has power law behavior as the baseline. Yes, there are exponential bubbles, but that's not the baseline. And power laws are more stable than exponentials. So I thought, well, let's get the opinion of one AI uh, as to what it thinks about Bitcoin as a special purpose AI. So I asked ChatGPT, as an AI, what do you think about this? And uh, at first it demurred. You know, I just asked it cold and it demurred. And then I gave it these five points. And I would say, you know, I, I worded them slightly differently and it actually improved the wording of those five points. And then it went on to say that your arguments present a compelling case for considering Bitcoin as a form of special purpose AI for money. While it may not fit the traditional definition, it embodies the characteristics of an intelligent adaptive system given complex and emergent behaviors, decentralized self-governance, and the creation of extensive networks. One could argue Bitcoin functions as a specialized form of AI for money, representing innovative alternative to traditional financial systems. So ChatGPT recognized Bitcoin as a special purpose AI. And that's the end of the slides. Uh, I don't know if you have any closing questions. Uh, <laughs> there, there are so many interesting yeah. things and like the, the special purpose AI uh, is, is, is uh, really interesting. I never saw Bitcoin like that because as someone who has a Bitcoin podcast, you are now my 202nd uh, podcast actually. Uh, and because I do some podcasts with, with people, um, with more than one person in the podcast. So there's probably like 220 people already. And I heard so many different explanations of Bitcoin, <laughs> why Bitcoin is and what, what, what Bitcoin is. And I never heard Bitcoin as an AI. That's an, it's a new angle. And I always look forward to new angles and perspectives on, on Bitcoin. And I feel like this, uh, one and a half hours that we had now around that time was really cool in form of like, we have a summarize of, of Lindy effect of, of the uh, power law and all those uh, forms really nicely in understandable in, in one and a half hours. Uh, because that's one of the, the things that I got from my first uh, power law exposure on the podcast with Giovanni. It was, I think, podcast 80 or something like that. If, if someone is, wants to see it, it's, it's just type in Giovanni or the power law in, in my YouTube channel. It, it, it will pop up. Is this also the, I think, the 10th or 12th 
12 most watched episodes, so it's it's easily be findable. Um, but a lot of the this this laid a lot of the groundwork of like what is the Paulo, uh, and uh, before we even started with his slides. We talked already one hour and, and the podcast went down like mm -hmm. in, in total two and a half hours. So I think this, this is a really interesting and, and great uh, summary and, 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 and um, great one piece uh, where you can get a nice information of what the, the Paolo is, of where Bitcoin might go and also some, some snippets like the, the, AI, the special purpose AI in there and something like that. So I, I really liked it and I love that you, you were on the show. I have as the... End routine. I have a thousand other questions, but let, let's come mm -hmm. to the end routine. Maybe that, let's do in a half year or one year a, a second round on that. Uh, I have an end routine where I ask one question that is always the same and then uh, another end routine. The first end routine where I ask uh, everyone the same question um, What can we learn from you uh, besides Bitcoin and all the things that we already talked about on the podcast? What can you learn from me? I think uh, I think the idea that Bitcoin is rooted in physics. It's rooted in energy. It's rooted in math, cryptographic math. And then it's rooted in human networks. So the combination of power, electrical power, laws, Satoshi's laws and protocols, which include crypt cryptography, and then human response. And if you have power and you have laws and you have human response, you get power law. And the human response, If you get in a network situation, networks of humans, then you get emergent behavior. And that emergent behavior can have power laws. And we see that in technology adoption. We see that in communication networks. We see that in social networks and social media networks. And they're naturally emergent. So I, I think the whole idea is that these power laws are grounded in nature in physics, in energy. And this means that Bitcoin is grounded. Bitcoin is grounded in reality. It's not just, it's not a virtual currency. It's grounded in real physical law. I love that a lot uh, because it's like the, the nature aspect of it and uh, it's, it's, it's grounded in, in something more than just digital and uh, not touchable. Um, the end routine of our, our podcast is always where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest mm -hmm. uh, actually is. And your question is interesting. What has Bitcoin taught you about yourself? Hmm. Well, I, you know, my life took an interesting turn when I had children. <laughs> I had never had kids. And uh, my oldest son is seven. My younger one is three. And there's an overlap between when I came to Bitcoin and when I had these children. And so I, I think uh, there's an intertwining between what being a parent has been teaching me and what I've been learning about Bitcoin at the same time. And uh, both of them relate to having a longer term horizon. Uh, I think being more stoic, but uh, really taking a long term horizon, you know, for the benefit of these young boys. Uh, so it, You know, I, it just encouraged me in, in terms of more long-term thinking. I've always thought in large scale, because I come from astronomy, it's natural <laughs> to think in very large scale when you come from astrophysics. But this is more about uh, human time, thinking in long human time scale. Oh, I don't know if that yeah. answers it. 
I, I, I love that a lot. Uh, your, your view on that. Um, perfect. Then thank you, Stephen, for being on. Thank you for joining us today. Before I let you go, where can people uh, find out more about you? I mean, it's on the slide, money uh, or debt. Uh, on, it's your ex handle, right? Yes, money or debt on Twitter. Perfect. So people can uh, reach out to you and ask questions if they have uh, more to that. Uh, yes. those or they can find me on uh, Substack under Stephen Perrino. Perfect. Then, yeah, thank you for being on. Thank you also for everyone watching and listening uh, for being here with us today. Uh, as always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. It's been my pleasure, Robin. Thank you.